Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Gabriel. Uh, this um, episode of Exploring the Quran and the Bible involves a uh, talk that I initially recorded for the International Quranic Studies Association annual meeting, which was in San Antonio um, this past uh, November 2021. Uh, it addresses the question of reported speech. So this is an episode in which you get to see some of my own ideas, some of the questions that I'm uh, working on in the field of Quranic studies. Um, is really, uh, I think, understudied. That's like an idea that's totally been missed, which is, um, does the Quran, in fact, intend to capture historical speech? Does it mean to give direct citations of, for example, the opponents of the prophet? Um, or is it God's paraphrase of those statements? So I begin to explore that. It's sort of the beginning of, um, of an answer more than a definitive answer, but there are interesting questions involved. Um, some of which are a bit theological, but most of which has to do with um, the nature of the Quran's discourse and uh, its quality as a book. Um, but I think that that particular question of are these the things really said by um, the contemporaries of Muhammad is an interesting one. And I hope you'll find this a fascinating episode. While you're here, please um, like the episode that really helps out and um, make sure that you're subscribed to Exploring the Quran and the Bible. Once you're subscribed, go ahead and hit the bell so you get notifications. And yeah, I'm, I'm not making any money at all, not a penny out of this, but I'd be really grateful if you would spread the news um, and help build up the channel so that um, more and more people can um, you know, get in touch with some of these academic discourses around Quranic studies and biblical studies. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Gabriel. Very happy to be with you and uh, to have this chance to share my paper with you, but very sad not to be with you in person. So apologies for that. Apologies to all of the Notre Dame students who are there and alums. And a special thanks to uh, Haytham and Andrew and everyone else who has worked so hard in making this conference a reality um, despite the particular challenges that we went through. So I don't take for granted all of their efforts. I'm going to speak about a reported speech I don't have any grand arguments or conclusions, so um, hopefully the, um, the discussion will be interesting and thought-provoking, but keep your expectations low. So here we go. Here is my PowerPoint, and let me go ahead and get it into presentation mode. I'll be speaking about reported speech in the Quran and covering the following topics. What's interesting about reported speech, I'll try to explain how I got interested in this idea and why I think it's worth thinking about for both the theological and philological uh, reasons or from, <laughs> excuse me, from those perspectives. I'll give some examples of reported speech, speak about the features of reported speech, ask whether Quranic speech at all reflected in the Hijazi Arabic. I mean, I'll just review some others' arguments. I won't really give my own. And then are there cases where the Quran tries to present or imitate local speech? And then finally, something on eyewitnesses. Okay, so those are the topics that start with a preliminary, preliminary, uh, uh, remark uh, or remarks um, on this topic. I became interested in it because um, I thought with some uh, friends at Notre Dame about the way in which the Quran reports speech from pre-Muhammadan prophets uh, and most scholars, uh, Muslim scholars would say, well, they didn't speak Arabic. So let's take the case of Noah or Abraham. They would have spoken something else. Let's just for fun call it proto-Semitic. Uh, and so they would have spoken proto-Semitic, but not Arabic. So when the Quran quotes them in Arabic, is it really their speech? So here's just uh, an example there with Abraham's speech. Uh, so are those Abraham's very words? No, because he didn't speak in Arabic. Hopefully that idea makes sense. Now in New Testament um, studies, this is sort of not controversial. It's pretty clear uh, that the words that we have in the Greek New Testament are not the words that Jesus and his companions and his opponents spoke because they spoke principally in Aramaic. So we have a translation of those words and the Old Testament, uh, sorry, with the pre-Muhammadan prophets uh, in the Quran, uh, it's the same case, right? Um, uh, but what about uh, Muhammad's own contemporaries when we have reported speech from his opponents or others? Uh, they spoke in Arabic. So could it be the very words that they spoke that we have in the Quran? Ho hopefully that question makes sense. Um, I'm really grateful to the work of uh, Travis Zadeh for helping me think through theologically some of these matters. His really excellent book, The Vernacular Quran, um, notes that theologically, 
um, like everything is sort of cool, right? Because uh, at least from an Ash'ari perspective, um, God's speech is, as he says here in Ibarra, um, not Arabic, but um, kalam nafsi or um, divine speech, which resides in God's essence, um, and is then rendered into Arabic through the process of revelation. Now, Ibn Taymiyyah wouldn't put it this way. He would say um, God's speech is in Arabic, but even then we could still ask a question for Ibn Taymiyyah um, or from his perspective, but is the Quran anyway um, presenting the very speech of Muhammad's opponents or God's own um, summary or paraphrase of that speech? No, there's nothing here that's really challenging, I think, the theological understandings of the text, right? Either option is fine. Um, so I wish I were there to discuss that further with you, but um, I would just have to leave it at that. Uh, so um, and now, is there a way to assess um, whether the actual formulations and syntax, et cetera, of the reported speech in the Quran um, could in fact be uh, the speech of Muhammad's contemporaries? I'll, I'll sort of touch on that today. And again, the point is not to study two layers of the Quran, which is what Carl Fuller's and I think now Marine van Putin are up to understanding the Quran's earliest um, articulation and then the way that speech was adapted maybe to classical Arabia. Uh, so I'm not really interested in that, but I'm just asking something about the Quranic author's intentions. Was there the intention of capturing reported speech? Okay, so that's sort of what's up. And here I just am isolated um, Quran 34, mostly because I was reading this surah with my students, and so it was um, on my mind. And uh, uh, just these are some examples of reported speech. So, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفْرُوا لَا تَأْتِينَ أَسَعَةً وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفْرُوا هَلْ نُدُلُّكُمْ عَلَى رَجُلًا يُنَابِئَكُمْ إِذَا مُزِقْتُمْ قُولَ مُمَزِقٍ إِنَّكُمْ لَفِي خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ Et cetera, et cetera. So you have all the reported speech here. I'll just leave it up a little bit. I won't read through all of it. But um, lots of examples in this sort of reported speech. And I'll say some things about the nature of the subjects who are giving this speech. Okay, um, uh, other scholars have worked on reported speech. Thomas Hoffman in his, uh, um, his work, The Poetic Quran, speaks of the opponent's direct speech act. Nikolai Sinai writes in his, his uh, historical critical introduction that these exchanges or the quotations of dialogues between Muhammad and his opponents are not unreasonably seen as having some grounding in real debates. It would, of course, be naive to treat them simply as unfiltered transcripts. Um, so uh, he's a bit um, cautious about assessing reported speech as transcripts. Um, so, and, but the most important work uh, on reported speech has been done by Mehdi Azayez. Excuse me for a second. And um, this is an article he's written in the Counter Discourse, but of course he wrote a book, an uh, entire book on this, which I will get to in a second. But here he says, basically, it is reasonable to affirm that the reported speech um, and therefore Quranic reported speech is a construction um, because it imposes or um, involves a, uh, an event, a speech act, which is always new and cannot be reduced to that which precedes it. At the center of this irreducibility, there is a Quran which offers at the same time, it offers itself at the same time as a mediator and the media through which the speech is um, communicated. So um, a very important point, which sort of summarizes my whole argument. We could sort of stop there and you wouldn't have to deal with me any longer. Um, here's his book, uh, Le Contre Discours Coranique, where he speaks about passé, présent, and futur as um, three um, categories of reported speech. So the passé is basically the earlier prophets, the futur is eschatological, so principally what the damned say in hell. In the present are um, Muhammad's contemporaries. Um, and uh, he notes on page 59 that basically this group in the présent is uh, split between um, uh, defenders and uh, of the prophet and adversaries um, of the prophet. Um, and we can see which the, the way, as he explains, but here quoting Mustafa ben Taibi, how the Quran, uh, the Quranic narrator gives life to the text and um, does all of this in order to achieve, and there's a nice expression there, the effect of the real. So that's pretty important. Um, I, I would speak about this as a mise-en-scene, um, 
which is crafted and stylized to present um, the effect of the real, to give a, a, a staging to a drama, which is important to the communication of Quran's own message. Nurdaka uh, noticed in, um, a long time ago, um, this is a passage quoted by um, Mehdi Azai, is that uh, the speech of Muhammad is very close in the Quran to the speech of earlier prophets, uh, and um, so he says this in sort of old Orientalist fashion, that the old prophets preach exactly like Muhammad. They have the very same charges against their opponents. The Quran goes so far as to make Noah contend against the worship of certain false gods mentioned by name, who were worshipped by the Arabs of Muhammad's time. And that's an allusion to Surah Nuh, Quran uh, 71, uh, 23, which mentions those gods. Okay. Um, a uh, couple of re really important observations about recorded speech, which really get to the heart of the matter. Um, as Nudika says, uh, the speech of the, <laughs> of the past, excuse me, is close to speech of the present. Um, that's true for the contre discours, as it is true for the speech of the prophets themselves. And a really important point is that the speech of the opponents is almost always a group. So one statement is asserted or attributed for an entire group, which means like most people, when they speak, they don't speak in chorus, right? A whole group doesn't say the same thing at the same time in this or in a chorus. And so does, does the Quran even mean to report direct speech um, in a literal way, uh, or is it um, staging something um, differently? Uh, there, Man Desaius says the same thing. Um, he notes that um, not only is, are there groups, but he says, that these groups are usually not designated explicitly. So names are not given um, uh, for the most part um, to those who give um, the counter discourse in the Quran. Um, they're simply believers, hypocrites, people of the book, et cetera, et cetera. But names are generally not given. And here we see some examples. This is again from Quran 34. <laughs> Etc., etc., etc. In verse um, 43, there. So, um, again, so we see it's always, it tends to be groups who, who speak. Um, and uh, uh, Mehdi uh, gives an argument for why this is the case. And he says, by not naming an explicit opponent, it uh, is a way of devalorizing the, uh, the adversary. Uh, but at the same time, it also allows for one to widen the scope of the discourse because um, the audience in different contexts is able to imagine themselves as part of the drama. So this is a reason for the anonymous format of some of these statements. Finally, an interesting point I would just say is we have certain cases where the reported speech is articulated in a way that continues the Quranic rhyme. So here's an example from Surah uh, 34 where we have the, um, in verse six, we have Al-Aziz Al-Hamid, and in verse seven, we have reported speech. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفْرُوا هَلْ نَبِلُكُمْ عَلَى رَجُونَ Et cetera, et cetera. لَا فِي خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ which matches Hamid in verse six and matches uh, Al-Ba'id in verse eight, right? So that gives us a sense of the highly stylized nature of counter discourse in the Quran. Uh, and just to sort of uh, make the point that the um, discourse in the past is like the discourse in the present, um, I just took sort of at random the theme of a prophet being nothing but a human. So here we see all of the messengers uh, who speak um, uh, and um, uh, they are uh, said um, by, their, um, by their opponents. Uh, uh, sorry, for, I'm just reading through this as I'm speaking and not being very articulate. Um, in antum illa bashurun mithunna, um, and then we see it again. They say here in Surah Yasin, uh, ma antum illa bashurun mithunna, uh, in Surah Furqan. Uh, here we have an allusion to the, pro the Quranic prophet himself, where um, it just speaks about him doing things like in, um, a human eating food and walking around the market. And then in Surah Al-Isra, we have uh, the Prophet himself um, saying, being commanded to say, and presumably saying, Hal uh, kuntu illa basharan rasulam. So again, a similar formulation, both used for the Prophets before Muhammad and for Muhammad himself.
So the speech uh, and the discourses are very similar, as Nandaka said long ago. Here in Surah al um, he is made to say, Qul anna So um, again, that formulation very similar to what we find in Yasin and in Ibrahim. Okay, um, this is an old debate whether Quranic speech reflects um, uh, the, the spoken Hijazi Arabic, um, and the, the, there's this idea that, um, already found with Carl Fuller's, that it was adapted to meet the poetic language of, uh, of the eastern part of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, so there you have some quotations from Versteg, I'm probably uh, not doing honor to the Dutch pronunciation of the name. Um, and uh, again, another quotation which addresses this idea that this original Volkssprache um, was adapted into the poetic language of the Nejd, which is the Schriftsprache, and the absence of the glottal stop, for example, uh, is a feature of the Hijazi Arabic. Just do a shout out here for Ryan, for Ryan Van Putin's forthcoming book, where uh, he's, he develops this um, as announced, promised, uh, this uh, the question with more data. So we're all looking forward to that. Okay, just really two more topics to address about recorded speech, um, and then I will say goodbye. Uh, first, uh, can inscriptions help? Um, this is an idea I had that you know maybe we can look at um, inscriptions from around the time of the origin of Islam and see whether the recorded speech in the Quran is somehow closer to the language in the inscriptions and therefore reflects um, actual uh, local speech. So just, I thought I'd get a couple of inscriptions up here. Um, first is an inscription from Enjof or ancient Duma, um, studied by the Danami, a uh, Christian inscription, but in Arabic script, probably from, um, well, in fact, it's dated. So from the mid sixth century dated to um, 548 or 549. Um, and here you see um, the uh, Arabic uh, expression with dhikr, dhikr al-ilah, something like that. Um, and then someone named Hag, Hajj, the son of Bar, using the Aramaic Bar, uh, Salama, something like that. Okay, and then on the right hand side, we have the inscription just recently studied and published um, by this remarkable uh, uh, fieldwork done by Hazim Sidki and Ahmed al-Jalad. This is the Riyah Azalala inscription, uh, where we have something like Barak, Barakakum, Barakum, Rabbuna, and Naqarah Bar Saad Saad. May our Lord bless you. Um, uh, I am Qarah, uh, the son of Saad. Um, so uh, we have this language here, and um, it will be noticed even in this very small sample size that the language is not similar to the Quranic language of recorded speech. Now, some of the vocabulary is common to the monotheistic uh, 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 lexicon that is shared by the Christians of um, Arabia and the Quran, uh, references to the root baraka and the rab, use for Lord, el ila, obviously, and dhikr. Um, but the formulation um, is nothing uh, precise like what we find in recorded speech in the Quran. Two other inscriptions that I thought I would address. One is from South Arabia, the so-called Jabal Dabub, the Bub in, uh, inscription, um, uh, which has the so-called pre-Islamic Besmala, uh, and you have the text there on the left-hand side. Again, we have language um, which is common to the monotheistic world. Um, Ahmed al-Jalad has shown that it's close to some language in the Psalms, I think especially Psalm 90, he identifies. But the roots, for example, ra, za, qaf, is common to the Quran, or fa, da, lam. But the particular formulations um, are uh, not close to what we find in the Quran of reported speech. So um, with the exception of, um, of the Basmala, which is um, not presented as reported speech in the Quran, but is in a position of invocation as it is in this inscription. Um, and then finally, on the right-hand side, the famous Zuhair inscription, um, the, uh, which was widely celebrated as sort of giving this sure evidence supposedly for um, the traditional date of Omer's death. Um, there's an interesting article by Robert Kerr in which, um, available in academia, in which he contests that assertion, adding that the dating 
was added later on um, epigraphic grounds. He makes a case, some other grounds as well. I'll just leave that argument aside. Um, but the expression Anna Zohar Kitabdu Zeman Tuwufia Omar is um, again nothing like the sort of um, uh, reported speech that we find in the Quran. So um, that's probably not super exciting, but uh, it's just a way um, maybe of getting another perspective on the highly stylized nature of reported speech in the Quran. Um, now, there are some cases in the Quran where we don't have the group speaking or we have the group speaking in a very distinctive way. And I think these are the sorts of passages where that I would look at and probably call for more attention if someone was to look for local speech in the Quran. And so I sort of looked around in not a very systematic way, um, I admit, uh, at um, places where you find an individual speaking, um, at hapexes, at, at commercial time terms um, or terms from everyday life, and Medinan passages, which more often involve um, social or um, household questions um, than Meccan passages or so-called Meccan passages. And I just thought I'd share three, which I think are worthy of at least thought about whether they could preserve some sort of primitive reported speech. Um, one is um, this uh, passage um, about the Mubahala in Surah Al-Imran, uh, verse 61. Um, and now this is framed as divine speech um, uh, uh, given to the Prophet. You know, if someone challenges you about him, then say, uh, the nebtahil uh, is a hapax in the Quran, a very unique phrase, and um, it could reflect some sort of hijazi formulation or turn of phrase, um, it seems to me. Um, uh, and so maybe uh, mark something um, uh, primitive, if that's the right term. Um, I don't mean that in a bad sense, but just in uh, an early layer um, of speech that is closely connected to local speech. Uh, and then there are a couple of places where we do have an individual speaking or saying to have spoken. Um, this is a really interesting one in Surah Al-Ahzab, where um, uh, God reports to Muhammad what he had said. Um, uh, so, uh, so by tradition, this is what Muhammad said to Zayd. And then we have a quotation of what Muhammad once said. A very interesting. So there we have something that could be thought of as pretentious reported speech um, as what Muhammad really had said. Uh, so I think that's interesting to uh, think about. And one other example also from the personal life of the Prophet is in Surah Al-Tahreen, um, where we have a report, um, first of all, of what um, uh, one woman, by tradition one of the wives of the Prophets, when he's uncovered their plot, uh, said, uh, men hadha. So very short, right? Just um, three words, well, four if you count the um, object suffix. There um, and then you have the prophet's uh, response. So we have a dialogue reported of something that was really said. Uh, so can that be thought of reported speech? So right. Those are interesting possibilities, and there's probably others I'm missing. So um, Reynolds at nd.edu, or even better at Gabriel Said R. Uh, um, so you can email me or uh, tweet at me and we um, with any suggestions about this. Final point, uh, I thought I would um, raise the possibility that um, it is, as the Quran is being um, codified um, uh, and canonized, it is um, done so in a context where there's still eyewitnesses who presumably could have heard reported speech and potentially um, corrected anything which was off or shared um, a, a primitive version of that reported speech. And I thought an interesting parallel case to that sort of possibility is the work of Richard Balcom. And I'll, I'll put these up, I won't read through them. But as some of you may know, Richard Balcom um, wrote this very influential book in 2006 um, on the eyewitnesses arguing basically against the long history of form criticism in New Testament scholarship, 
And as many will know, forum critics basically said, listen, we have three different contexts, at least they're really distinct. We have Jesus context, we have the context of the early church, and then the context of the formation of the canonical gospels. And the early context um, in each particular Zitzim Leben, so each particular social context, original primitive sayings of Jesus would have been reshaped and changed and adapted. You have to be attentive to the Zitzim Leben um, of each particular layer of the text, and you sort of see the evolution of these terms and see how they fit particular times and how they fit to different uh, genres or gatomen, which have particular roles and all this. And then Balcom came along and he said, yeah, that doesn't really work because there were eyewitnesses alive still at the time of the formation of the Gospels. Um, um, and they would have controlled by their own memories of Jesus's original sayings. Uh, they be, in particular because the eyewitnesses would have been leading members of the community who were, who were responsible for the formation of the Gospel texts. Um, so that's the basic argument. And you can read through the text. Maybe you already have as I was speaking. Okay, um, uh, so I mean, right, the, the last point I made there, they remain throughout their lifetimes, the sources, in some sense, they may have varied figures of central and more marginal significance, the authoritative guarantors of the stories they continue to tell. So um, this uh, uh, argument was refuted in a really interesting article in JBL, so shout out to JBL and um, SBL, by Judith Redman, How Accurate Eyewitnesses, where she uses different psychological data to try to show that eyewitnesses themselves are influenced by various things, um, uh, including the community in which they are, faulty memories, um, and uh, sometimes all they preserved was the wrong memory of what was really said. And so, um, um, but the community's influence is really uh, key and memory can be, um, can be uh, misshapen. And um, so as she says, uh, eyewitnesses only testify to the community's agreed version, not of these exact details of the event itself. And then there's a response to Judith Redman also in uh, the Journal of Biblical Literature in which um, uh, Robert McIver says, well, no, if you look at the data more robustly, you'll see that um, there are cases where um, eyewitnesses are um, not 100% accurate, but largely accurate in getting um, the fundamental um, uh, details of an event correct. Um, and just one interesting case that he studies in that article is the case of a robbery at, I think, a gun shop in uh, British Columbia at a place called Burnaby in Canada. And there was, uh, people were able to sort of like sociologists were able to study the eyewitnesses to this robbery. And um, uh, they were allowed to because there were no charges pressed. And so it wasn't a court case. And basically they were able to study them immediately after the event and then a, a significant amount of time afterwards. And the long and the short of it is they had about 80% accurate of the events that were, they were able to be controlled by looking at like camera footage um, uh, and uh, it was just simply studying the story in which they were. Now that's more about events than sayings, but it does suggest that um, eyewitnesses are, um, are important. And so at least I think in thinking through recorded speech in the Quran and the extent to which it, re it reflects things that were really said, uh, um, the continued presence of eyewitnesses in the Quranic community um, could be taken into account. Um, they could have, in fact, remembered what was said to the prophet by the opponents and um, uh, act, acted as guarantors, somewhat like Balcom says, for the eyewitnesses to the Jesus tradition. Okay, I'm basically done. Here are some conclusions. Language of reported speech does not contrast with the language of the Quran's divine discourse. Um, I showed that in the first part of the talk, I hope. Um, there's not a special correspondence with the inscriptions. I didn't show that very well, but I think if you look at the inscriptions and you look through the cases of uh, Soda 34, um, you'll see that that is the case. Um, uh, the eyewitnesses, I think there's some argument that they could have controlled the Quran's reported speech, um, but what was their understanding of the text? Did they understand it as a version of what was really said, or rather God's articulation of what, um, of what God wants to say? And then um, finally, the example, for example, uh, of uh, Quran 34 verses 68, which shows that the rhyme is kept with the reported speech, 
is just a good way of illustrating that recorded speech generally is highly stylized and is part of the Quran's larger mise en scène. And I would just say this um, is not really a new conclusion. Um, uh, Mehdi Azai has, has really shown the way for that. And um, although I've asked some new questions, I've basically come to the same answer. So thanks for your patience with me. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference and um, see you next time, I hope, in uh, the next Excel event.